We're going to talk about another pitcher that the Dodgers are linked to. And that's Japanese pitcher Shota Imanaga. And Imanaga is someone that doesn't get the pub and doesn't get the spotlight and the buzz that Yamamoto gets for good reason, rightfully so, but he's also someone that can help this team and would be a lot more inexpensive than a Yamamoto. And insider Mark Feinstein, he said that the Dodgers are lining up to be a landing spot for him, that they could sign him. And Feinstein said, Imanaga started the gold medal game for Team Japan in this year's World Baseball Classic kicking off a year that saw him go seven and five with a 266 ERA for the Yokohama Dina Bay stars. He has been one of the best pitchers in Japan since he's broke into the central league in 2016, posting more than a strikeout per inning throughout his career. He is expected to be posted by Yokohama, Yokohama this off season and should have multiple suitors. He lists the Dodgers giants and Mariners as fit. So you got the usual suspects right there. The Dodgers giants, the Mariners on the West coast teams that Japan players love to play for Japanese players definitely flock to those types of organizations. And the way I look at him is I see, I see Imanaga as the ultimate Yamamoto consolation prize. If you miss out on Yamamoto and let's say the Mets go crazy and get him, let's say the Giants go crazy and get him. I think the Mets and the Giants, those are the two, th th those are the two franchises that I think are in the driver's seat that have the inside track on him just because one, yes, the Mets are rebuilding, but he's so young and you need pitching in New York that he can help you years down the line. And like JP Hornstra, the insider that we had on this show, he talked about how a lot of these pitchers from Japan, they tend to have arm issues at some point. And I think if you're the Mets, you can afford to play the long game, especially with the Giants too. You can play the long game as well. The Dodgers are a team they need to win next year. They need to, at the very least, get to the World Series, at the very least, maybe get to the NLCS. But hey, at this point, you take a postseason win when you consider they've won a 211 games last two years and have one postseason win to go for, to show for it. But I think for this Dodgers team next year, if you don't get Yamamoto, Imanaga does make some sense. And I've seen out there people saying, okay, Imanaga and Yamamoto, that they're comparable, that they're close, that there's a lot of similarities there as far as how good they are. Just stop with that because Yamamoto is on another tier. He is elite potential. It's elite versus good, right? It's not the same. Now, Yamamoto is really good. He's someone that has the potential to really be an ace for a team, but what I look at for Imanaga is he's someone that has a lot of potential because you look at the stuff he has. His stuff is filthy. It's nasty. The strikeout numbers, the walk rate. But if you look at his numbers overall, he has a 266 ERA, a career 296 ERA. That's solid. A 266 ERA in 2023. So for his career, a 296 ERA. And then this year, a 266 ERA. So you compare that to Yamamoto, he has a 172 career ERA and a 116 ERA this past season. So yeah, not comparable. 266 versus 116, a 296 career versus a 172 career, Imanaga and Yamamoto. But so he's not a substitute. It's not a situation where hey, if you don't get him, it's a, he's a B. It's more like he's an A, Yamamoto's an A. I would say he's more of a B minus possibly a solid B if you're comparing the two. But like I said, stuff wise, he's nasty. He actually struck out more batters and at a higher rate and walked them at a fewer rate than Yamamoto this past season. He posted an impressive 29.5% strikeout rate. That's higher than any Japanese pitcher, save for Otani and Yu Darvish in their final seasons before heading to Major League Baseball. So you're talking about striking out hitters at almost a 30% clip. That's up there with the Darvishes and the Otanis before they made their way to the show. You also factor in that usually you'll see strikeout numbers go up from when you go to the MPB, a lot of disciplined hitters there. You go to Major League Baseball, there's a world where you see a spike in that strikeout rate. So maybe you get him to up to 30%, which would be elite from a strikeout territory. So your question probably right now is, wait a second, DMAC. If he can strike out more batters at a higher rate and walk them at a fewer rate, he's got nasty stuff. Well, then what separates him from Yamamoto? I'll tell you. He allowed, Yamamoto allowed two home runs last year. 
two home runs were served up by Yamamoto. You compare that to Imanaga, he allowed 18 bombs last season. So he served up 18 home runs. Yamamoto served up two home runs. So that is really what separates them is Yamamoto is elite at keeping the ball in the yard. Imanaga, not the same. You look at the home runs per nine, the difference there, it's really, really high. And yeah, I mean, most pitches, their home run rates, they usually go up. So not only does the strikeout rate go up, their home run rates usually go up from going pitching in Japan to pitching in the show. So if that happens for Shota, and you're talking about a guy who could be serving up two home runs every nine innings. That could be costly. We live through that, right? I don't want to see Lance Lynn, basically the Japanese version. We don't want to see that. But still, I do think when you consider the value and how much he would cost, and the difference in price, I wouldn't be mad at it. I definitely think if you could get another elite starter, whether it be via trade, we've talked about this ad nauseum on this show, whether it is a Corbin Burns, whether it is a risk and take a flyer on a Tyler Glass now, or a Mitch Keller, or a Dylan Seas. If you get a Dylan Seas and an Imanaga, and you got Bob Miller coming back and emerging and continuing to grow, and you got Walker Buehler coming back from injury, you got some of these other pieces in place, then I'm starting to feel okay about it. It's not the perfect scenario. It's not the ideal off season, but at least you're addressing the starting pitching with a free agent and someone via trade, or do you go a Nola route? Do you get a sunny gray? Do you get like no. So depending on the primary piece, the a one, you have to get one ultra premium. That's non-negotiable for me. If you don't get one of the top three elite starting pitchers that are available, whether it be a Blake Snell, whether it be an Aaron Nola, right? Whether it be one of these top guys, maybe even Jordan Montgomery. I don't know if I consider him the top tier elite, but if you don't get one of these starting pitchers, they're going to have to pay at the very least a hundred plus million for. If you don't get at least one of those guys, it's going to be a failure as an off season. You definitely have to spend the money. Yamoto would be great. Like I said, he's young, he's unproven. The injury issues could be something, right? I still want them, don't get me wrong, but it, when a team is as desperate as the Dodgers to win next season to maximize the primes of Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts and change the narrative of what happened last two postseasons, this franchise realizes that you can't let history repeat itself for a third time. Twice was already too many for most Dodgers fans. Three will be unacceptable to the point where there's going to be some Dodgers fans that are going to just check out and give up on this regime. And you're going to start wondering, is Friedman the guy? So I think for, I believe in Friedman. Trust me. I also criticize him as well. But if you go three straight clunkers with this payroll, with this talent, people are going to really start questioning the direction of this franchise. But let me know down below. What are your thoughts on Shota Imanaga?